Hello, Mid-American Gardeners. We are so glad you've tuned in and we're glad to be here, aren't we? Everyone's yeah. nodding their head. Yeah. So we hope that you will stay tuned and maybe you'll have a question for us as well. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of ACES. Now, who else is here with us? Let's find out. And I'm gonna introduce first, John Bonesteiner. Hi, John. Hi, I'm a Vermaine Master Gardener. Um, I like um, just about anything that grows green. Uh, I found out this last couple of weeks, I, we were down in the southeast or southwest and nothing there is green. It's 120 plus degrees. So I was really glad to get back. <laughs> when I got back, we had some grapes in Vermillion County and this shows uh, black rot on grape. Uh, unfortunately, there's not too much we can do now, but uh, in the spring, we're gonna, or this fall, we'll have to make sure and clean up, prune back any, uh, any of the fungus that's on the vines and the tendrils, and then really make sure that all the mummified, you can see mummified fruit here, you can see how it starts on this grape, and clean up, clean up, clean up, and then spray before uh, any of, or right before and after it flowers. One other thing I brought <clears throat> was apples. So this is an apple off of my uh, <clears throat> transparent apple tree. And the reason I brought it was most people think that they have to wait till the fall to use their apples. This low dye or transparent apple is ready now. If you wait too long, it's going to turn mushy and it makes the best applesauce, which I brought for uh, a sample for Diane. Yeah. <laughs> is it tart? It is very the tart. The apple itself, yes. but you've yes. added yeah. some sugar. And... Some sugar, brown sugar, uh, just re regular sugar, and Vietnamese uh, vanilla. Ooh. I, I, I'm sorry, you mean Vietnamese cinnamon. I was going to say, that sounded interesting too, though. Kind of, yeah. And a but little bit of nutmeg. Just a... Sounds good. So I don't wait if your yeah. apples are ready. If you have um, early... If you, certain types of apples are ready now. Mm -hmm. And it's taste testing. It's really, that could be one way to find out. So. No well, thank you for the fruit update, John. Very good. And in the middle, Marty Alanya. Hi, Marty. Hi. I, uh, my name's Marty Alanya. I'm a private landscaper. I kind of, I lean toward perennials and shrubs. Um, I try to be as maintenance free in landscaping as possible. That's why people hire me. And for show and tell, I brought my favorite sprinkler. I had to borrow it off of um, one of my clients. I love this thing. It's made by the Melnor Company, M-E-L-N-O-R. You can close off the ends here on both ends so you can make the spray narrower. It is eminently adjustable. No clicky, no clicky, clicky, click. No, it's nice and smooth. And if you even have it that narrow, it still does what it's supposed to. And no matter <laughs> how low or high the water is, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. I love this thing. I'm hoping my clients will leave it to me in their will. That's a hint. <laughs> Thank you. I love this thing. <laughs> so if you see one, Melnor, if I see one, I'm buying it for me. Wow. It's my favorite sprinkler. I love these things. And think about how we would have used it last year. Oh my gosh, yeah. So oh, this year is yeah. kind of... Oh yeah, and you know, it's, it's important to anybody who's set up a sprinkler has been frustrated by this. You know, you get wet, you don't have it just right. Eh. You know, don't waste the water by running it where the weeds are gonna grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And don't waste the water. So, just we need it all. you need it. Yeah, sure, put it Very right good. where you need it. I love this thing. Okay, so we're gonna go away from her and, we're, and her, her sprinkler, but thank you for showing that. I have to take it back tomorrow, but I'm gonna keep it all You're night, enjoying just it. Just with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to move on next to Dr. Jim Appleby. Hi there, Jim. Hi, Diane. Well, I'm an entomologist at the University of Illinois, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking mm -hmm. trees, shrubs, and flowers. Now, last week we had a caller that uh, he said he had a willow tree that was infested with blue or greenish flies. He seemed to indicate maybe it had a cavity in the, in the willow tree. I, I think I... That's, at least that's what I thought he said. And I have a sneaking suspicion that tree may have been uh, infested with a disease that we call uh, slime flux, mm. which is uh, actually uh, caused by bacteria. And uh, the tree responds by producing a large amount of sap. That sap then is very attractive to flies, particularly these flies that are bluish or greenish in color. They're sometimes called blue bottle flies. And uh, 
that's one reason it could possibly be attracted to that. The other reason is that these flies also lay their eggs on dead animals. So if that had a cavity, there could be a, a dead bird or a bat or a, a skunk, well, or a raccoon or possum <laughs> or something like that <laughs> in the uh, cavity, and then the flies are attracted mm -hmm. to that, so they're coming in. So I have a feeling those it's either one of those uh, um, problems. Now, I also brought in an insect, unfortunately, it died on me just the other day, and this is the uh, this is the longhorn beetle. Mm. It's actually called the Carolina pine sawyer, and uh, this insect is responsible for the death of pine trees throughout the entire Midwest. And the disease is called pine wilt disease. Mm. When this beetle emerges from a tree that's infected with the pine wood nematode, the nematodes enter the breathing pores of the beetle just before they emerge. And then this beetle will fly to a healthy tree and uh, then feed on the tree. And when they feed on the tree under ideal conditions um, with a lot of moisture on the branches, nematodes will leave this beetle's body and then enter the feeding wound of the tree. And then the nematodes start multiplying very, very rapidly in the tree. And in a matter of about five or six months, the tree is dead. So if you travel the interstates throughout the entire Midwest, you'll see large numbers of Scotch, red, and Austrian pine <coughs> dead. And 95% of those trees are killed by the pine wood nematodes. So it's a very serious problem throughout the entire Midwest. And these uh, beetle, this is a Carolina pine sawyer. So this is the primary vector of that nematode. They're sometimes called longhorn beetles because they have these very long antennae. But anyway, that's a story. And here, this uh, branch here, shows the actual feeding injury that the beetle causes. They feed on the bark of the tree, and uh, when they feed on the bark of the tree and you have moisture on the bark, that's when the beetles can, the nematodes can leave the beetle's body and enter these feeding wounds, and then the nematode multiplies very rapidly in the tree and kills the tree. We're so, all kind of sad because we've probably each yeah, that's <laughs> experienced oh, dozens uh, of them. Yeah. Yes, it, and sure. It's, and that's the ring, right? That's yeah, I, I just would not, I don't think I want to be planting too many scotch, mm -hmm. red, and Austrian pines no. anywhere in the Midwest. I but white pine is there. not... White pine occasionally, we, you know, we at the University of Illinois studied this problem for about six years, and we found that white pine uh, occasionally does get pine wood nematode, and it kills a white pine, but it's rare. Okay. So you can relax, those of you who have white pine. Right. Well, and they always blame the beetle, because that's what you see. But it's, see the nematode, it's but the nematode. Teeny. There is right. one spray that uh, is available that a person could use. It's called, it's produced by a Rainbow Tree Company. If you look on the internet, Rainbow Tree Company, there's a chemical called Pine Tech, P I N E T E C T. It acts as an injection. You can use it as an injection. It has to be done by a professional arborist, though, and that protects the tree for at least two years. There's some debate on how effective this is, but I think if I had a very valuable tree, a scotch or red pine in my yard and I wanted to protect it, I would it. probably want to treat that tree. Okay, well thank you very much. And I wanted to just mention how great our trip, our WILL uh, TV trip was to England. We've just gotten back and we saw some beautiful things. It was quite warm there. We saw beautiful castles, great castles. Uh, went with a lot of great people and they were you know, right through there, beautiful flowers, the roses, the <coughs> lavender. We really saw three months of flowers packed in, and there's some of our trip with our guide, Victor, there in the middle. But we had a great time seeing these beautiful gardens. Um, great Comp, we saw Sissinghurst, uh, Beth Chatto's gardens. It was truly spectacular. There's Beth Chatto's. So uh, thank you to everyone who was traveling with us because it was really fun. Okay, now. We are going to go to a video now, and it's called a crazy bush, and we haven't seen this. None of us have seen it, so we're going to see if we can figure out what it is, but the uh, viewer has sent us a picture of a shrub, so we may get stumped, but let's see. Hi, Mid-American Gardener. This is Hope from Cullum. This is a plant vine bush that's in our backyard that's growing on an old TV antenna. I was wondering if you know what it is and if it's ever going to flower. Um, it eats everything in its path. It's eaten our rose bush, which is right there. It's also eaten our wind chimes, which is over here. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. 
Um, is it ever going to flower? If not, how do I get rid of it? It's just a nuisance. Thank you. Oh, that looked like fall clematis. Did that look like fall clematis? Yeah. Did you? Yes. I thought it looks like clematis. Man, is it rampant? But it's you're right. fall yeah. clematis. It's the, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. or if you're from England, clematis. Clematis, mm -hmm. yeah. Or if you're from the East Coast, clematis. actually. But great. We know the answer. We, we didn't did. look at it before. John and I it, apparently it, were both in the Southwest <laughs> here recently. My husband and I took a trip to Texas and it didn't look anything like that. There well, was cactus. It's been <laughs> an ideal wet year, but oh it will gosh. flower in the fall and it smells like yeah. honey. Yeah. It's oh, really yeah. beautiful yeah. white. So yes, yeah, your it, crazy it, bush oh, is yeah. a vine. Yeah. So there you go. So yeah, if you have nothing, something to yeah, send yeah. in, if you have a plant to ID or a, an issue, uh, you're welcome to send that uh, to us as well at yourgarden at gmail.com. So just take a little video on your phone or, you know, camera and send that to us. Well, that was fun and we didn't get stumped. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, let's go to line two and we're going to um, hear a question about a butternut tree. Hi there, line two. Yes, uh, I have a question. I have several butternut trees that I planted in a five-gallon bucket. They are two to three feet tall. Some leaves are trying to slowly turn yellow and getting some brown blotches on them. Is that too much water or not enough? Can I put some amorgalite fertilizer on them? Now, so they're in a five-gallon container? Yes. Bucket. yes. Yeah. So are you going to plant them? Uh, eventually, yes. And when is eventually, I guess? is Well, sometime this fall or next fall. I would say the sooner the better. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's probably, uh, you know, we've had a lot of, of fungus diseases this year. Yeah. And um, the horse chestnuts, for, for instance, had a lot of mm -hmm. spots on them. And, and just like the grapes, uh, that is another fungus. Uh, we, with the, the spring that we've had, if you've noticed the last couple of mornings, uh, it's, you go out and walk in the grass, it's completely wet. Um, and I, I, butternuts, uh, you, I, I don't think they transplant very, real, real easily. Um, kind of like a, a couple of the other trees, uh, you want to get it in as soon as you can. Could be stress. Uh, as far as melorganite, that's a fertilizer. I don't know that I would stimulate any more growth with it because that may just stress the amount of growth that that tree is able to get out of that small amount. Even if it's a five gallon bucket, that's still not a lot for a two or not three for foot a tree. tree. Yeah. So I would, I would caution you not to do that. Uh, keep it moist, you know, the, the old finger test as far as whether it's, it's moist enough uh, in the soil. Um, you don't want, make sure it has a hole that's not being over watered because you don't want to have uh, at the bottom sitting with a whole bunch of water and those roots are rotting. The, so. But I think we're pretty unanimous that, you know, if you can get a cooler weekend, not extreme heat, I would get those trees planted. Yep. And then water it for the first three years <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and don't trim. They're telling us now don't trim any trees for the first three years after you plant them any extra branches unless they're damaged. And then maybe put the milorganite on next spring. Yeah, yeah. But Once not you get heavy. it into the ground. When it's in the earth, yeah, yeah. not right. in the bucket. Right, not yeah. in the bucket. Great, that was a good question. Thank you very much for that. Thank now, you ooh, we have a tomato question. Look John. out, John. <laughs> so let's go to line three, and it's about tomatoes. Hi. Hi. Um, I planted a variety of tomato called Sir Speedy. They were supposed Would to be- Would you say that again? Sir Speedy. Sir Speedy, Sir Speedy. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, they were just terrific the previous year. Um, they won't turn red. They look great, but they won't turn. And the 59 days yeah. is well past that it was supposed to ripen. Yeah. How come they're not ripening? Um, we've, we've gotten to be really hot and the, the, the dryness and the... It, Sir Speedy is kind of like um, July 4th or uh, uh, Siberian tomatoes. They're, they're ones that right, they're supposed to ripen within 59, 60 days. Mm -hmm. And it all depends greatly. We had a very cool spring, very wet. All of a sudden, it turned extremely hot, uh, and, and they'll, they will. It's just not going to be probably in those 59 days because, for one thing, w with the cool weather we had this spring, it 
Tomatoes and peppers produce a chemical to slow their growth down when it's too cool, when it's below 70 degrees. And then that plant has to digest that chemical before they start to mature, and, and that's probably what happened. Now it's trying to catch up. Kind of watch to make sure you keep them watered, uh, and even watered because otherwise you may end up with some blossom end rot. Uh, you may even have some of the flowers or small fruit abort because of the extreme heat and, and, uh, and dry. So. so good, very good question, Sir Speedy. Yep. All right, well we're gonna move on to an, um, line four, and this is about Epsom salts. Hi there. Hi. What's my, your question? My question is, I saw an article that stated that it was good to put Epsom salts around uh, flowers as well as vegetable plants, that it was good for the plant and it discouraged insects. And I just want to know if this was truly safe. It is. Um, I've never heard of the magnesium. It's, it's Epsom salt is. You soak your feet in it, and I usually tell my pay, you know, people if they, they what do I do with it? And I say go put it around your tree. It, it, it is really helpful as far as the leaves. That if if you've got dull leaves or kind of light green, it will really help. The, it's a minute mineral that really does help as far as some of the uh, mi minor minerals. Also for color in flowers, it'll, it'll make those more brilliant. Uh, you can overdo it. I wouldn't put more than a teaspoon's worth around each plant. Uh, if you've already mixed it, uh, just take it in the sprinkling can, go around once. And if your soil is, 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 is minus the uh, Epsom salt, the magnesium, um, then it's going to help. If it isn't, then you probably will notice very little. Won't hurt them unless you overdo it. So. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for that. Well, they don't have any insect repellent. No, I, as far as I've never heard it. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Exactly. Never heard of that. Mineral introduction. Yeah. Yes. What I was thinking. Okay, well, don't go away. We'll be right back after this special Did You Know? totally agree with that. I do too. That's really great. Yeah, I totally so, agree. So get out there and garden. Maybe <laughs> early in the day if it's hot, <laughs> oh my but gosh. still get out and garden. Well, let's go through another either email or show and tell. And so, John, would you like to show sure. us something fun? We all talk about prickly. <laughs> our bad yuccas. And I've, I saw this one today and it um, really you know, I, I've been looking at these around some of the different uh, places, and it's called Color Guard. Uh, I'm hoping that it doesn't spread like most yuccas, um, but it has a, a, it's variegated to the point of really being very, very nice as far as the yellows and different colors. And it, the filament on the edge of the leaf is just, striking. Yeah, yeah. It's, one it's one of my light. one of my favorite plants. Yeah. And, and I so, find they're not very rampantly growing. No, no, no I, I've don't. never seen, you know, I've seen them in some of yeah. the yards for a number of years and, and, and they haven't spread at all. So well, now yeah. this one here has two little babies, which I'm going to cut off and, <laughs> and try to uh, yes, propagate right there away. So that's how um, you pick your plants out, by that's, how many that, things that's you can buy from. Correct. I do <laughs> know that too. But anyway, I want to, to show that there are some nice yuccas out here. Oh, and um, really nice. you know, everybody gives yuccas, you know, oh, if you got one, you never get rid of it. But. This is one I think I'm going to keep. There's so many nice variegated ones anymore, yep. but that's a pretty yeah, one. That's beautiful. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, thank beautiful. you, John. And now, Marty, we'll move on to you. Oh, yeah. They have, they have great color. And I actually find the, the variegated ones aren't quite as stalwart as the non variegated oh, ones, yeah. with, yeah. as is usually. Yeah. So, and every place in my yard, it's not dry enough, but I love those things. Um, Judy Fair, who is often on our panel here, um, was watching the show. And someone called in with a question of why their peony wouldn't flower. And apparently the panel couldn't really figure out what was going on. Well, she realized the peony was by a solar light at night. And peonies will set bud, flower buds under a short day condition, but the solar light at night being on was making it into a longer day. So the peony just 
Wait a didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> something you have to keep in mind. Good so, eye, Judy. Oh, yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was a great observation there. It was. So, thank you for bringing that out, Marty, because that is really good. Mm -hmm. So, thanks well, a lot. Well, and solar lights are really, I mean, I like them too, you know, but I hadn't even thought about it. But you have to, to but, yeah. position them. Yeah. So, they don't shine. And that's like with the yard lights too. There's it other is. plants. Sure. That if people that have yard, yard lights, I've heard that they wonder why their flowers or something is different than normal. Mm -hmm. And it's because they never are dark. Yeah. And so some, mm -hmm. some plants will and not. And that's a hardiness issue mm -hmm. for some plants, not going dormant. Mm -hmm. They show it with poinsettias, how the ones closer mm -hmm. never flower mm -hmm. yeah. and oh, as gosh. they go farther away. It's very interesting. Yeah. So be careful of positioning your solar lights. Okay, now on to you, Jim. Well, we had a uh, email concerning. Uh, th this is a very long email, but anyway, it had a question about squash bugs and how to control them on such plants as cantaloupes, squash, zucchini, and uh, cucumbers. They sometimes get on. Um, you know, you've got to watch your plants. And if you have problems with squash bug, uh, when a plant starts vining, uh, that's about the time the squash bugs. Um, uh, come about and uh, if, if we see that that's the picture that we're showing here actually shows the eggs the mm -hmm. brown eggs on the undersides of the leaves then those hatch into little gray nymphs mm -hmm. and then they have piercing sucking mouth parts they pierce the uh, plant tissue and uh, then uh, the plant sometimes because they're so abundant actually kills the plant as well if you see uh, that you have some little bugs on the uh, vines. Uh, you can dust them with seven would be one way. You could dust them with pyrethrum. Um, you could spray them with malathion. Actually they're easily killed so there's really any of the insecticides would easily give control. If you apply the insecticides though do it towards the evening hours um, because uh, bees are important pollinators of the plants and you don't want to kill off the bees so do it in the late evening or well late afternoon or, mm -hmm. or evening hours when you apply the, the spray or dust. And I think that would give control and you don't have problems with those squash bugs. Okay. Well, I couldn't resist bringing in some green beans because things are going well in the green <laughs> bean area this year. But I have quite a few and I wanted to show the variety. I, I've grown about six different beans this year and a couple uh, dried beans. But this is the Kentucky Blue Pole Bean. And this is an extremely nice one if you're doing um, county fairs because it hangs and it's you know pretty nice and straight. And then this is Roma too, and these are the, the nice Italian, the broader beans, uh, really meaty, good flavor. And then this is an old standby called Top Crop, and it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit thicker, it's meaty, and I like to combine them when I'm cooking with them with onion and other seasonings. But um, I'm growing dried beans as well, and you don't pick those until they are dry, but it's been a great year. Mm -hmm. So these are going to be gifts uh, after the show because I have plenty. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well. Good, because I don't have I any. do, I have plenty. <laughs> well, let's go to the phone uh, lines, and we have another tomato Hello, question. Barry. Thanks for that, and this on line five. Hi there. Hello. Yes. I have a question regarding white flies on my tomato plants. They're just Swamped with white flies, and I'd like to know what I can use that would still be safe for me to eat the tomatoes when they ripen. Thank you. Okay. You want well, to do sticky traps? Or you go you can use the yellow <laughs> sticky traps. Yeah. Um, they, they're, they're not that effective. Yeah. What you do is get a yellow piece of paper and spray it with a, a, a sticky spray, or you can buy them pre. Mm -hmm. But again, seven works pretty good. Or just the um, uh, liquid um, pyrethrum, would pyrethrum, be. and and the uh, what is it? The soap. Um, oh, insecticidal. Insecticidal soap. soap. Yep. We mm -hmm. used to use that on on hibiscus. We we had the the, the white flies just infected our our. They like uh, hibiscus. Yep. The hibiscus, and yeah. so the insecticidal soap will will get them. And you'll the never get them with one spray. No, so they no. have no. to repeat, repeat, They're repeat about mm -hmm. about every five days. Yeah, their life cycle is really short. And make sure if you spray them, insecticidal soap, like John says, is really safe. And make certain, you can even do it like in a little hand sprayer, just mix up a quarter of it or a pint of it, but make sure you get underneath the leaves. That's where they live. They're not on top, they're underneath there. You gotta get under the leaf. Okay, so the uh 
the RISAM is uh, safe to use. C E R M E T H R I M. High yeah. High rethrins. Yes. I'm sorry, there's an echo. That's, that's safe to use. Yeah, read the label, but uh, you know they, that's a very safe material to use. Pyrethrum or pyrethrum daisy, painted daisy, mm -hmm. is yeah. a, yeah, that's a natural. It's in the aster family, and it's the root. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is very safe. I so make sure that's much. what it is. Very good. Oh, a lot yeah. of good tomato questions. Yeah. There's a company called Safers, Safers mm -hmm. Insecticidal mm -hmm. Soap. They're like they're it, you know. Yeah. So. And everywhere. I like the name, Safer yeah. Soap. I mean, it helps you remember it. <laughs> yeah. Well, boy, we have the best viewers, don't we? They really have good questions and also good comments. We want to thank you for that. Well, thank oh, you, man. folks, for being here. I'm really glad that you were here to answer all these good questions. We thank you for watching, and we will see you next time. Goodbye.